So, but it's important we take this 10 minutes we had to uh, go over some questions and comments that you may have. So I would like to give the floor to the audience first, please. Anyone would like to ask a question or comment? Zaki. Somebody bring a, a mic to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentations. In fact, I really enjoyed. In fact, I'm very familiar with what Michael and Helen has presented, and I thank them for their excellent presentation. I have more questions for Hassa and Christoph because I also find found their presentation fantastic. It's the first time that I saw what Christoph used to describe to me without images. You know, so now I could relate more to it. Uh, Hassa, just directly, I wanted just to ask you. Your excellent study of Mecca, which is really a very important, I think, um, step in understanding what's happening now to the cultural heritage of Mecca. In fact, in we had a forum uh, earlier this year, and Mecca was very much discussed. The, um, so I feel like your study is really important um, in perhaps future uh, strategies for the planning of uh, the Haram and you know, and also the surrounding areas. Is there, I mean, with oh, your excellent work, where you're going? I mean, is are you working with the government? Are you um, influencing, you know, future decision making and how the planning should go in the future? So that's my my question to Hassa, and my question more to Christoph. Um, I, uh, you mentioned about the compatibility with the GIS, etc. We have a GIS lab here. We're going to start an MA program soon. We will. I was at a meeting f two weeks ago on historic cities in the Arab world. So I, f I see the potential, actually, of how we could um, develop this to be linked into, you know, a kind of a monitoring mechanism for historic cities in the Arab uh, in the Arab world. So could you comment a little bit on that and the compatibility issues, which as a non-technical, I mean, I understand, but I'm not a very technical person. Could you tell us a little bit about the compatibility of the program you have developed with the GIS? Where, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it's working. So um, where we're going with this research, I think it's a good question. So first, I think on the first day, we discussed the role of documentation in influencing management. And I think it's definitely something that we are, um, the point of our research is to kind of share this knowledge in order to influence whether it's urban planning, whether it's uh, designed for the future, and how to manage uh, the expansion of Mecca. Um, what we do usually is um, we have this uh, open platform. So we're always engaging with the public. And I feel, uh, we feel that it's a very strong effort and very necessary to help um, not just raise awareness locally, but also you start to get a lot of um, information and different perspectives of the uh, city. Um, what we are in the process of developing is firstly a, like a manuscript um, and an archive book that can be shared and read by different people. So people that are more interested in the historical background or people that are more engaged with urban planning um, or Dep you know, depending on what your purpose is for the city, uh, f for with Mecca. And the other um, thing that we're working on is um, to produce a an exhibition of this work. So where we exhibit the work, we share it on different platforms, whether it's in, in Mecca and Jeddah and in the region, and also we look into sharing it um, in London, where we're also based. So it's always about kind of a conversation. We never see it as a... Um, as a closed dialogue or like, we always try to bring people, even from their different backgrounds, whether they're journalists or whether they're um, historians or architects. I think it's, it's really important to have a wider conversation. Yes. Uh, in terms of compatib com compatibility, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, it's a, of course, it's a very important question. The first thing I would like to say is that the way we developed it in-house, it's not meant for any kind, uh, unlike um, the, 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 the software yesterday presented was uh, where you had, there was this sample testing on all the mobile phones. We did not 
look for uh, universal capacity, cap capability uh, for the use of the tool. We just, it's basically, the, the tool is built with uh, open source bricks, uh, computer bricks, which are in the sense that they're elements that are, have been collected by the computer team to, that are available and that are supposedly compatible with almost all uh, tools like uh, Apple or um, Google or interfaces are, uh, yes, and Unix and all this. And um, so most of, uh, from experience, uh, the thing is working on different brands that we used. Uh, we never faced any incompatibility with any specific device. Sometimes it looks a little different from one to the other, but it basically works on all of them. And it's based on an Excel, uh, the data is based on an Excel format, uh, in uh, Unix format, but compatible with Excel. Uh, and so it's basically uh, all the GIS systems are using Excel as a source for the information. And they're all compatible with Excel-based uh, format. So basically all the GIS tools can take directly the data from and automatically collect the data from the Excel table. You just have to attribute the columns or the data to uh, the maps that you want to have. And you can directly link appear on the map with the, the data can show on the maps directly from the table. So basically if you, for example, I'll give you an example very basic. If you give values to the different plots of uh, or different houses and you have a map of these houses, on the map, according to the value that you have on the table from one to five, for example, you have the red, the five will become red, will show red, and the one will show green, and it will be automatic. And the, the map will update itself uh, as long as you update the database. So when you change, you, you work on a house and you restore it, and it becomes, the color will change automatically from red to orange or to green on your map. And this is what it's meant to be for the management. And it's the same goes for the monitoring of the sites. We were talking about it for Abu Dhabi, for example, uh, because they have teams that are uh, working and surveying s f more than 450 sites around uh, very different, uh, very wide distances. And they don't have the human resources to do, uh, to, to work, uh, to do this monitoring, regular monitoring of the sites. So basically, uh, the monitoring of the sites can be, w w is really processed through this system, would be uh, automated, and the people would not have to work from the office anymore. They would go on the site, complete the data, update the information, and uh, immediately when they're home, uh, upload it, and it's there. And it's there with the date, with the people who did it, and so on. And you don't have to worry about processing, putting names to pictures, adding, uh, organizing your files. And also, I didn't mention this, but when you work in big offices for the management, you have different people working on the same files or uh, interacting from different angles. And many times, you don't have, you don't know where the access is, uh, who somebody works and registers its pictures in one way, the other does it in another way, you don't know where to find them. Everything is, uh, in this system, everything, you don't have to worry about it. It's all in one place and coded in such a way that you just have to type your keywords, your GPS, whatever, um, look at the map, and you have the access of the information. So in, in terms of compatibility, it's based on the GIS uh, through the Excel file. And uh, in terms of computer systems, it's, uh, as I said, it's Unix-based, so. Yeah, thank you, Zaki. I know that this is a concern as a former person who's worked on inventories, and now as a funder, it's definitely something that I'm concerned with. Open access, open source, not supporting things that are closed in, but also when we talk about compatibility, any kind of inventory system, mapping, or data collecting, you need to take into consideration that we might have to migrate it to another system or we might have to merge it with an existing system. So if engineers could work on this compatibility, it would be key because otherwise we will be uh, doomed into having to support different systems who will be working in isolation and in silos. And this is definitely not something we want to do. Um, would we have one more question or comment? Two. All of them, really. Uh, I have a question about Mecca, really. And I was excited to see you do the study of the lighting. Because I can 
agenda uh, in, um, in Saudi Arabia, you have a lot of energy and with cheap LED lighting. I mean, do you think that any of your studies will be put into the force of law to, to prevent light pollution, to control lighting? Um, um, Is there a problem with light pollution there? I imagine, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we can call it light pollution. So there you have a, sp a very special condition where, so the, the mosque itself, the Grand Mosque, needs to be super well lit. And you ha exactly. And you, when you're there, you have this kind of uh, feeling that even if it's four in the morning, it doesn't feel like it's been four in the morning, you know, it, it, because it's a, it's, there's no time limit. There, the sense of time is very different to any other city because it's constantly shifting and it's always about the um, movement, actually. So um, in terms of light pollution, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure if, if, if that is the case, uh, but it's interesting to read uh, light of Mecca because you have um, a specific language. So for example, by code, uh, all of their mosques need to have a green neon light. This is something that we just found out uh, through our process of research. So uh, it starts to be really interesting to look at uh, Mecca at night. And um, you, from like standing from the mountains, for example, we could almost uh, point out where the different mosques uh, surrounding the Mecca, يعني, the Haram were. So for me, I think light has a, is a very interesting element to look at, and it allows for further layers of reading into the city. So I think it's an ongoing um, effort to kind of try to unlock what, what different lights, what different colors, all these things mean. You may have too much lighting for a hotel or... So I think in terms of program, you need you need that. I'm not sure if it's a code. So there is a code for the mosques, but it's not a, it's not a code. Uh, at least I'm not aware of it being a code throughout. What we witness is that there's a difference because the unplanned settlements are uh, illegal. I mean, illegally, and they have they have no infrastructure. How they p tap into the electric uh, infrastructure of the city. So so this is where you kind of start to understand where lighting is almost as like legal, illegal areas, uh, wealth dis distribution, you start to get a lot of different layers, whether it's social or economic. So it's, yeah, and I think we share this information with other entities. Now we're partnering up with a few governmental bodies to just share the work. Um, and I think hopefully that's gonna be an interesting prospect. No worries. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. دكتور سيف من جامعة الشارقة سؤالي للدكتور مصطفى أيوة من جامعة العجمان ما شاء الله بحث رائع ونقاط واضحة لكن ما أدري يعني أنت ذكرت أنواع التراث مادي وروحاني أنا أتصور يعني روحاني يقصد فيها أكثر شيء ديني لهذا التعريف اللي متعارف عليه هو مادي ولا مادي لما نخلط بين اللا مادي نقصد فيه الروحاني توجهنا أكثر شيء إلى اتجاه الديني شكرا شكرا للأخ على هذا السؤال وحقيقة الروحي والمادي هي الحياة بكل صفحات تنقسم إلى مادي وروحي لا يعني الروح شو الترم اللي متعارف عليه لا يمكن أن نقصر الروح على الدين أو العقيدة وإنما كل الأشياء غير الملموسة غير المادية تدخل في الإطار الروحي حتى السلوك حتى المزاج حتى الرؤية حتى الأمل حتى التفكير حتى الخيال كله يدخل في الروحي وبالتالي الروح تسمو على المادة والمادة هي من نتاج الروح وكل الأشياء التي لا نلمسها كالعمارة والفن والنقوش والوثاء كل الأشياء الملموسة هي نتاج وإسقاطات للروح على المادة فتظهر بشكل إنجازات 
وحقيقة حتى في الأوراق التي احنا سمعناها هناك تمييز كبير بين الثقافة وبين التراث وبين الحضارة وبين الروح وبين المادة وهذا في طبعا جدل عميق دائما كل الأشياء التي في المخيلة وفي الذاكرة تدخل في إطار الروح وهي انعكاس لروح الإنسان وقدراته العقلية وقدراته الذهنية خياله وين يمتد والمادة هي كل الأشياء التي نتجت أو أنجزت نتيجة لخيال العقل أو ما أنتجه العقل كل الأشياء المادية التي نلمسها في المادي هي من نتاج العقل والعقل هو انعكاس لروح الإنسان فالروح تتجسد في العقل والخيال وكل الأشياء الأحيان المنظورة وغير المنظورة بمن فيها الشعر والعاطفة وكل الأشياء تدخل في الروح شكرا جزيلا انا اتصور انه في ترمولوجي متعارف عليها يعني انه مادي ولا مادي ما عندنا روحاني و... كيف تفسر اللا مادي اللا مادي يعني هو هو غير المنظور وغير الملموس وين يدخل يدخل في اطار الروح وفي اطار الرؤيه وفي اطار الخيال لانه في ناس ما يؤمن بالروح اصلا اللي ما يؤمن بالروح هذا عنده مشكله لانه لانه الحياه من دون روح عبارة عن شيء لا يمكن فهمه. احنا نفهم المادة والمادة كل الاشياء المادية من خلال الروح. والروح تتجسد في العقل وفي الرؤية وفي الخيال وفي التخطيط وفي كل الاشياء، فالاشياء التي لا تقبلها لا يقبلها العقل لا تقبلها الروح. وبالتالي لا يمكن ان نفصل الروح عن العقل. فالروح هي الحياة بتجليات العقل. وكل الأشياء التي تنتج عن تجليات العقل نتيجة الطاقة الروحية هي عبارة عن إفرازات للأشياء المادية التي نراها مجسدة في إنجازات الإنسان شكرا جزيلا Thank you. If you don't mind, we can continue the tangible and intangible conversation because it's a very interesting and very important one over coffee, actually in some countries I think Ethiopia, the coffee uh, serving tradition is intangible heritage. Um, so uh, thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you, everyone. It was very interesting. Again, we've learned some things. And we'll take a short coffee break. Thank you.